Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. My name is Mason and let's hear some stories from Reddit. But before that, don't forget to press the like and subscribe so you won't miss any videos in the future. Or maybe leave a comment down below. That really helps the future of the channel and means so much to the effort that I put in every day. Now let's dive into the stories. First story, scammers stole $15k from me so I shut them down. I was scammed when I was trying to sell my timeshare. I know I should have been more careful. And after paying them $15k I was trying to get back at least some of my money. The person I was talking to said I would receive a refund, but never received anything. I contacted the attorney general. In the state they said they were in and was told they could not reach them. So the next time I talked to them I conference and the person from consumer complaints, and she was able to talk with him. But he just have her double talk on why there were so many complaints. So I started a plan. The revenge, I work in high tech, and I went to their website and copied every screen they had and made my own with the word scammer in big red letters across the page. After I had all the pages created I created my own site with the same name as this except mine had the word scam at the end. I used a popular web hosting site to create my send website and publish it with my domain name. It cost me $90 for one year. I even had other people who scammed by them contact me on my website. I tested my website using other computers to Google their name, and my website name showed up right under theirs. So anyone who Googled their name would see the scammer's site and mine next to each other. It took about three months, and their website was taken down. Another three months and their phone number was disconnected. So I basically put them out of business, because they would not refund any money from me. I would have been happy with $5k refunded, and consider the $10k a lesson learned. Still do not know what happened to them but about one year later, I got a call from another company somewhere else. But it had the exact same setup. I just ignored them, lesson learned. Second story, how my ancestor, supposedly, took down a racist businessman. This is an old story that have been told in my family for as long as I can remember. We're talking my grandfather was told it by his grandfather, and so on. Note that this story has had close to 200 years to be embellished and twisted so take everything with a grain of salt rather than scream fake. Even if only a fourth of the story is true it's still a great story. This is the story of my ancestor we'll call John because that's the name I've always been told. John was a black man in America during the time when slavery was dying out. His grandparents having been brought there from Africa along with their children. John eventually was freed through some means. I've heard both that he paid his way out or the state he was in abolished slavery and he was freed that way and found himself fighting in the Civil War because he felt it was the right thing to do. During the war he became good friends with a man only known as Mitch, who supposedly came from money but had joined against his parents' wishes because he believed in freedom for all. Again, grain of salt. The two were in the same regiment and made it through alive. Though some relatives say Mitch lost a leg or an arm in the war. Fast forward to the end of the war, and John and his new wife Mary he'd met during the war used the money he'd earned to set up a small shop on the East Coast most common city mentioned is Boston. In a small neighborhood, the shop became successful, John being a charming man and surprisingly savvy businessman. The neighborhood he'd set up in quickly growing as the city grew meaning there were always customers who needed whatever it was he sold. I've heard everything from groceries to workers' tools. They lived happily and had three children together during the time, spending a decade there when suddenly, presumably accompanied by the roar of thunder and screeches of crows, Mr. Business arrived in town. Mr. Business has apparently been on the wrong side of the war and fought quite hard to keep his slaves but was also smart enough to sell out other races. When he saw how the tides of the war were rolling, getting by with no losses except his free laborers, this had been the beginning of the end for his once successful plantation. Farm as all the workers he could find to replace his slaves had wanted things like pay for their services. He'd struggled to find loyal workers that didn't charge more than the absolute minimum and after a series of bad harvests had chosen to pack up, sell his land and head east to find a new source of income. He arrived and began buying up local businesses that seemed profitable and eventually found out about John's successful store. He was more than happy to discuss a fair price for the store, until he saw the skin color of the owner that is. Ten years not enough time to erase a lifetime of institutionalized racism. He began harassing John to sell his rinky-dink store and find a farm to work on. Don't quote me offering way below the actual value and when laughed out of the store. Began trying to sabotage John's business. Getting thugs to throw rocks through windows. Sabotaging deliveries. 
making a scene in the store. John soldiered on though, having grown tragically used to fighting against racism. He also had a lot of friends in the community who helped keep the store floating. Then it was that John's oldest son who was 30 and menace, 14 at the time found himself getting beaten up heading home at night from his job, again. Blurry details. And wound up with a lot of scars that he'd supposedly been stuck with all his life. John had had enough and as luck would have it, had an out, having been contacted by his old friend Mitch. Mitch was starting up a farm, plantation in the west, south, southwest and needed loyal workers. He'd offered John a foreman position, good pay and a plot of land to live on with his family. This, dear readers, is when the revenge plan begins. John contacted Mr. Business, offering to sell at 75% what the shop was actually worth. And maybe because his other businesses hadn't worked out. He took it. However, John supplied the contract and proper solicitor to make things legal. The contract basically saying that after midnight of the date of signing, the shop and everything inside would transfer ownership to Mr. Business. Little did he know that that day up until midnight, the shop was having a massive clearance sale, selling everything not nailed down at ridiculous prices to a grateful neighborhood. When they closed up that night and mailed the keys to Mr. Business there was little left to sell in the store if anything. John never found out what happened next as they left town soon after and never returned but personally I'd like to think that Mr. Business arrived with his workers to an empty store with no deliveries coming, screaming and crying in the mud as he realized he'd been outsmarted by a lesser species. John and his family moved to work at Mitch's farm for the rest of their lives, John supposedly passing away in his 60s. Thank you for reading. Again, a lot of this is probably embellished if not straight up a fairy tale, but my family all treat it as a true story and I felt it was too good of a story to not share here. Third story, The Great Arby's Avalanche. In my high school years I had a typical high school job of fast food worker at Arby's. Most of the job was very easy and surprisingly fun unless there was a real craft head manager that happened to be working that day. Well, this is a story about revenge on a boss, manager. Our store had a real gem female manager that was very out and open about her hating men. She was a lesbian, nothing wrong with that, and made it very clear to all males she absolutely did not matter to her. She would give females extra breaks, allow them to be late, give them free food etc. The males on the other hand were treated like actual piles of dog duty. The manager would leave us alone during busy times and sit in her car. She would take insane amount of smoke breaks and whine and complain at us when she'd come back and things would be all backed up. Eventually several months of her garbage attitude and clear hatred got the best of me and one day I had enough. And I hatched a plan. Arby's, at that time, used to take call ahead orders on large workplace or party orders. People would call in and say they needed X amount of sandwiches for a luncheon. These call in orders didn't need verified in any way. Anyone could call these in. I heard a different manager one time explain to someone that if someone were to call in a $300 order and ditch the order, he'd probably get fired for allowing that much beef to get wasted. The roast beef product at Arby's is treated like gold. One day I knew this manager was working with me and I executed my plan. About halfway through the shift I used the bathroom and texted a friend that was willing to help me. I simply texted him it's go time. My buddy then calls our store and puts in an order for 200 roast beef sandwiches which at that time would be about $300 minus $350. This didn't affect me whatsoever, because I was on drive through that day and didn't need to make food. My manager immediately gets pissed that she had to make all this food and starts the process. After about an hour she gets finished and goes on a tirade about how stupid everyone at that store is. Over the next two hours it was next to impossible for me to hold in my laughter as I could tell she was growing very angry and worried that the order was never getting picked up. I started noticing her making phone calls to other managers and upper management people about what the hell to do with 200 roast beef sandwiches. Eventually it was time for me to clock out and go home. So I did. Over the next several times I worked I noticed I was not with this idiot manager anymore. In fact, I never saw her ever again. She either quit or was fired. I guess I'll never know. Fourth story, homeowner got what was coming to him after daily harassment. I worked in engineering construction job last year for a home builder and we had to deal with a bunch of 5 grams anti-vaxxer health nuts moving into one of our neighborhoods. Constant complaints about the construction, the noise, the debris, which made no sense because they chose to move into the neighborhood before construction was completed. One man in particular would harass us daily, complaining about the streetlights being too bright, they weren't, and complaining about a generator we had running about a block away from him to power the site temporarily until we had the infrastructure in. 
The complaints ranged from the generator, was damaging his hearing, thing was almost completely silent, or that the fumes from the generator were coming into his house and causing him and his kids to have stunted development. They would come up with stuff that made little to no sense. It escalated to the point where he got the city and the mayor involved and we got sued so we gave in to his requests and moved to generator to an inconvenient location and had to take the time and money to rewire to be able to power the areas needed. This was including important stuff like the streetlights. We had to leave off for a couple nights until the move was complete. And you guessed it. He would call to complain. The nerve of this man. So here comes the revenge. We received an order from the city to install a 5 grams tower on site to improve cellular connection because the area we were in had pretty bad service. Since my team and I were in charge of creating the plans to install the infrastructure, guess where we all simultaneously agreed to put the tower? Right smack dab in front of the angry man's house. We thought this was incredibly hilarious and couldn't stop laughing every time he would call freaking out while the tower was being constructed. Got to the point he tried to file another lawsuit. Got laughed away. And within a week we never heard from them again. Moved out faster than the wind. Fifth story, revenge of the construction workers. I am a teacher and when I was younger, I would take summer jobs to supplement my income. One summer, I worked for a bricklayer named Jerry and heard an amazing story. I worked for Jerry in the mid 90 seconds. So the story either happened in the early 90 seconds or in the 80 seconds. Here goes. The setting for the story was a community of small rural towns, which had only only one brick contractor. Jerry began his career as a bricklayer working for this contractor. A real jerk. Jerk and jerk son, adult working the business with his father, would harass, belittle, and humiliate all their employees on a regular basis. No work was ever good enough, and employees were told they weren't worth what they were paid. Not only did jerk mistreat his employees, but he was equally rude to other subcontractors and to the general contractors who hired him. Since he was the only bricklayer in the community, there was nothing anyone could do about it. Needless to say, the turnover rate for the brick business was very high. The only person that stuck with Jerk and company was Jerry. Jerry told me that his father had instilled a self-confidence in him that Jerry could do anything he set his mind to do and that he should not evaluate himself according to what others said, but rather by the facts. Although Jerry was belittled by Jerk and son as were all other employees, Jerry was becoming a very good bricklayer. Jerry knew he was good. Jerk knew Jerry was good, but Jerk didn't know that Jerry knew he was good. Not only was Jerry a good bricklayer, he was very respectful to the boss who disrespected him. Jerk thought that Jerry was a naive pushover who was buying his head games. That would prove to be a huge mistake on his part. One day, Jerry was doing an exceptionally good job of laying brick. Not only was his craftsmanship amazing, he was laying brick at a high rate of speed so that he was making his boss lots of money. Of course, Jerk and Son were belittling his work as though he was doing the very opposite. This scenario was being observed by the general contractor of the project. After work that day, the general contractor asked Jerry to stay behind so he could talk to him. As did every other construction worker in the community, general contractor hated working with Jerk. General contractor told Jerry that he had heard Jerk and son belittling him, and told him that he disagreed with everything Jerk was saying. He asked Jerry if he had ever considered going into business for himself. Jerry said that he would like to do that someday. General contractor then said that he would loan Jerry the money to buy a mixer the most expensive piece of equipment needed to start a brick business. If Jerry would indeed start said business, the only hitch was that Jerry would need to pay for the mixer whenever he could and that he would subcontract under general contractor. Jerry agreed to those terms and prepared to begin his new venture. Jerry respectfully told Jerk and son his plans and gave his notice. The two mocked Jerry ruthlessly and laughed him to scorn. Jerk told Jerry, you'll be back into months begging to return to your job, you'll never make it as a subcontractor. Two months later, rather than collapsing as Jerk predicted, Jerry was still in business and going strong. One year later, Jerry's business was booming, and a drunk Jerk showed up at Jerry's house and begged him to come back to work with Jerk and son. Jerry, you're the best employee I ever had. Jerry replied, why didn't you ever tell me that when I was working for you? Jerk couldn't answer the question, and Jerry obviously didn't accept the offer for employment. Two years after beginning his entrepreneurial adventure, Jerry heard that Jerk and Son went out of business. Jerry said that he never intended to harm Jerk and Son when he accepted general contractor's offer. He said that looking back on things he realized 
that he had become Jerk's greatest nightmare. I can't say that General Contractor intended no harm. I thought the most amazing thing about the story was how that Jerry maintained his self-esteem in spite of all the ridicule. I also gained a respect for Jerry's father who instilled an unshakable self-confidence in Jerry. That's it for the video. Thanks for watching.